And they say, look over there, don't look at the wall, look at, those pe- look at that person buying bread for his family. Uh, it's a famous and a beautiful poem by Yehuna Amichai. Um, and most people would say that Yehuna Amichai is the most um, well-known Israeli uh, poet. Mm-hmm. Um, his poem um, has been translated into over 40 languages. Mm-hmm. Um, and Robert Alter would say that Yehuda Amichai is uh, the most widely translated uh, poet since King David. Um, and that's because Amichai created a vernacular revolution in Hebrew poetry um, and that his poetry is accessible um, and it is open and it's witty and it's ironic um, and it's generous and it's pretty as someone I would say I'm not the uh, I like poetry but I don't read a lot of poetry like I don't study that much poetry but for me Amichai's poems are really accessible. Um, He was uh, just a little bit more background, born uh, in Germany in 1924. Amichai and his family fled uh, the country during Hitler's rise to power and settled in Palestine. Uh, He fought in uh, the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. um, And after uh, uh, Israel was declared a state, Um, He uh, attended Hebrew University, was a teacher, uh, taught at NYU as well, as uh, UC Berkeley um, and Yale University, and he died in uh, 2000. So I'm going to share some of my poem, some of his poems, two poems I want to read tonight. All right, so Yehuda Amichai and Shavuot. So this will be an easy one. Why is this all about why, what's the connection to Shavuot here? Uh, can someone read this poem for me? I'll be glad to. Great, thanks, Howard. My mother died on Shavuot at the end of the counting of the Omer. Her oldest brother died in 1916. He fell in the war. I almost fell in 1948, and my mother died in 1983. Everyone dies at the end of some counting, long or short. Everyone falls in a war and deserves a wreath, a ceremony, an official letter. When I stand at my mother's grave, it's as if I'm saluting, and the hard words of the Kaddish are like a gun salute into the bright summer sky. We buried her in Sanhedria next to my father's grave. We've saved a place for her the way people do on a bus or at the movies. We left flowers and a little stone and little stones so that no one would take her place. 20 years ago, the graveyard was on the border facing the enemy positions. The tombstones were a good defense against tanks. Mm. Yep, keep on going. There was a botanical guard here. All sorts of plants and shabby wooden signs with names in Hebrew and Latin, the common rose, Mediterranean sage, the common shriek, the tufted lamentation, the annual lamentation, the perennial grief, the crimson remembrance, the sweet remembrance, the remembrance and the forgetting. Thank you, Howard. Um, So that was translated by Hannah Block. Um, Initial reactions to this poem, are there lines that stand out to you um, before we delve a little deeper into it? Anna? <laughs> I like how it says, um, everyone dies at the end of some counting, long or short. Everyone falls in a war and deserves a wreath, a ceremony, an official letter. Um, and, and also standing at his mother's grave, it's as if I'm saluting. That's, that's really powerful. I love that. What, what about the line that stands, that, the one about um, every, everyone dies at the end of some counting, long or short, really stood out to me as well. Why did that one <laughs> Why, why was that line powerful to you? I can't put, I don't know. I can't put it into words. It just resonates with me. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, um, yeah. probably, you know, two hours from now, I'll, t- I'll be able to come up that's with fine. it. Yeah. Um, any other people, any other lines that stood out to um, individuals? Yeah, for me, it's we, um, the hard words of the Kaddish are like a gun salute into the bright summer sky. Yeah. Hmm. That's right. The hard words right here, uh, Dave was saying, and the hard words of the Kaddish are like a gun salute in the bright summer sky. Um, and for you, Dave, what, just the 
the poetic nature of that or is there something more yeah, to it? It is like a it is like a poem all on its own. Right? Of course. Yeah. But um for me it's interesting because I always I always hated the the cottage to me is always was it was always thought of I thought of death all the time. And and then the first time I ever read it in English, I was older already and it already was death in my head was death and it was such a beautiful poem. But but to me still it's like a they're hard words. Right. They're hard words, right? But there is no death in that. It's a lot about praise of God there as well. Right. Um, and for me, that line, right, the hard words of the Kaddish are like a gun salute. For me, like, you think about a gun salute in the bright summer sky, like, people standing at reverence. Like, when I look at people in our congregation, people are standing, for the most part, very still at the Kaddish. Right? Yeah. Other people are, like, other places, other moments where, you, uh, and I, we are reading into this, right? There's no right or wrong answers in poetry. But I read this and say, when I think about our congregation or the congregation, other times people are moving back and forth, but when we have, when they, when we get to the cottage, for, people are still. There's no talking, of course, but people are moving back and forth, like a gun salute. Mm. It takes your breath away sometimes like that as well. Um, any other lines that- So, so what, yeah, what does that mean, the hard words? Because to me, and there's something very comforting to me about the Mourner's Cottage. I don't think of them, I, and and the fact that we say it in so frequently and that it's so familiar and that I know the words and that there is something comforting to me in that. Um, I mean, it's hard to think about death, but the words are comforting. So I'm surprised, I don't know. I don't think of it as so I think it's a little bit. So it is a hard prayer. Mm -hmm. So it's an Aramaic. It, you stumble across. It's not the most, it doesn't, I'm, like Brad, I, th I think you're right. Because like they're easy words for us. So we know it. If I wrote, we say it all the time. But if you, perhaps Amichai was like, it's, it's in Aramaic. It doesn't roll off our lips that easily um, as a, perhaps a modern Hebrew speaker. Um, maybe there, even for our, our community, there's a little bit of a, a challenging. I wonder if perhaps that's one way that you can interpret it. So, um, but off the hard words, right? When his mother died, um, there is, it's hard to say words, a Kaddish for someone that I, I love so much perhaps, or I, I struggled with so much. These are w words that I know I should be saying, but do I, am I able to say them always? Um, I'm remembering my, the loss. Um, Anyone else before I? Yeah, want to, I yeah. I'm very I'm very moved by the 20 years ago the graveyard was on the border facing the enemy positions, uh, and then the line. But when I was a child, there was a botanical guard. I have mm -hmm. these visions of the Israel that he remembers and what there is now and what the right. changes, uh, the way he expresses it. Uh, it had a lot of meaning to me. Yeah. So just to give you a little heads, uh, like. Where, where, where his uh, mom is buried is in Sanhedria. It's in the northern part of Jerusalem. Um, and it was, on, it was pretty much on the, the border before uh, with Jordan. Um, so it was, um, and so it, here's the line, um, the line about how the graves were a good blocking for the tanks in that sense. Also in Sanhedria is, it's named after the Sanhedrin, uh, mm -hmm. which is what the 71 judges um, because there is, uh, the tombs of the Sanhedrin are there as well. Uh, so there's other, so it's another, there are many other cemeteries there, but a famous cemetery there um, around the first century CE, uh, we found the arche uh, archaeologist. So, the, but the, it's not, it's now a very Haredi place. Um, it used to be not like that, but it has become a very Haredi area. Um, but so going back to what Jackie says, right, these are the, he remembers it differently um, than it was before, kind of, as well. His, just, just above that, when he talks about his mother's grave being next to his father's, and they saved the place for her, like on a bus or right. at a movie. Yeah. And, then, and no one would take her place. They're going to put flowers and stones there so no one could take up. The images are so mixed, because, I mean, we put flowers and stones, right. not flowers, but stones, we tend to bury parents next to each other, but we never think, I never think of it as 
like saving a seat on a bus. Right, so mixed, right? You, or when you're at a theater, you put your, or even at synagogue, you put your hat next to uh, the seat because you're saving it for someone. Like that for me, that, that it's a beautiful way that he uh, shares this, like, oh, these are the little stones that, right, we put on our graves, but it's like we're saving the spot for someone else to, to, to be next to the loved one. Well, they could make a journey together, they're, you know, saving the place on the yeah. deck. Howard. I was thinking no by the line, I was no thinking by the line about place. the bus and the movies. Uh, I think there's some wonderful metaphors there. You think of movies are usually about a famous person, some grand, and truth is there should be a movie about everybody because uh, yeah. everybody's yeah. life matters. We are all equal, uh, and the whole concept of the bus uh, is like being a journey. We certainly know that it is, and I think that whole line about thinking of it uh, as uh, the way people do on a bus or at the movies, that pretty much says it all for me. Beautiful. So I chose this poem because of the first line, right? My mother died on Shavu at the end of the counting of the omen. Even that line for me is a pretty powerful line because we just finished the counting of the Omer. And can anyone remind me when we've, how long we've been counting it and where we've counted from? Since Pesach. Since Pesach, right. And the counting of the Omer, does anyone know any um, prohibitions during the counting of the Omer? Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to have happy things or celebrations. Right, you, uh, you, uh, you're not supposed to be uh, celebrating, right? There's no weddings. I, you can't get your hair cut. You can't get your hair cut, right? <laughs> It's not, right, um, you're not supposed to uh, buy new garments. It sounds, like, you know, then, it sounds like we've been actually practicing this period of counting the Omer very well, right? I've, <laughs> I've had weddings that have been canceled. I have, I just actually cut my, uh, Ariel and I just cut my hair the other day, but I was growing out a lot, right? We haven't really been buying, we haven't been going to stores to buy it. Why are these in place? Why are we not supposed to do this? Because the counting of the Omer is a period of great mourning. Um, we supposedly, um, we remember the tragic death of 24,000 disciples of Rabbi Akiva who died of a plague. Oh. Pretty powerful thinking about it at this moment where we're, we're living. When, we, when over 100,000 people in our country have just died of a plague, of a disease. Um, and so this is a morning, this is a period of mourning. And then on Shavuot though, we celebrate. And so my mother died on Shavuot, right? I don't know if Amichai's mother really died on Shavuot. Perhaps, he, perhaps she did. At the end of Counting of the Omer, right? At the very end of mourning. He has to begin died. mourning again. Right, right, right. Uh, they're mourning again or we celebrate her life, right? She didn't die during the Omer when it was so, uh, yeah. and, and I'm reading into this, but that's what we do with poetry. She didn't die during the count. He could have written, my mother died during the counting of the Omer if she did. But the beauty of that is perhaps we're celebrating her life, right? Or is, am I mourning during this, this period? Or um, is it a double mourning? Or is it a celebrating of Shavuot as well and celebrating? His mother's life. Um, a powerful um, poem. Anything else before we move on? Because we have 15 minutes and I'm, we have a lot more to go. Well, I figured out a little bit why I like those lines about everyone dies at the end of some counting long or short. Um, that we, we, we do so much celebrating of heroes, you know, celebrities and people who are well known for doing great things. And, and, and he's saying, but everybody deserves Everybody falls in a war. Like everybody's got battles to, you know, your whole life you're you you struggle you don't struggle necessarily your whole life, but during your life you have many struggles and and just living is a challenge and everybody should get the kudos that you know they're all heroes in their own way. Right, um, and I think this line everyone dies at the end of some counting, right? Some we counting, count. some kind of counting. And mo hopefully it's long. Yeah. Right? Hopefully. hopefully we are counting a long time for people. But I know, and all of you know, that unfortunately we count some short times as well. Rabbi? Uh, yes. Yeah. I see, I see a lot of the poem um, as a 
history of the of Israel, you know, where the uh, you know where he says he almost fell in forty eight, so that's the beginning of the yeah. date of Israel, and then he talks about uh, the gun salute, uh, you know that Israel has become a mighty army, and then also then he talks about uh, you know the way Israel was in earlier times. So I see you know various parts of it all about the state of Israel. Yeah, and it's, and right, and then at the very bottom as well, like here. Those right? names, yeah. The names, and then like the crimson remembrance, the sweet remembrance, the remembrance and the forgetting, a powerful line at the end. What does it mean to remember and also to forget? Um, and how do we do that in our story? Um, and how do we do that with our loved ones? Um, and sometimes it's easier to remember. And sometimes we want to forget as well. All right, next poem that I want to read. Um, and this, so the next poem I want to read is about connected to this holiday because of Mount Sinai. And so we celebrate um, Shavuot that we got Torah from Mount Sinai, right? And so we celebrate this day and we, it comes from this text on the Exodus. Moses led the people out of the camp towards God and they took their place at the foot of the mountain. And rabbis have a field day with this text. Um, why do they, why are they at the foot of the mountain? What is happening there? What is happening? And so uh, here's a little bit of a, t a Talmudic passage. Can someone read this for me? The Torah says. Are we unmuted? Yes. The Torah says, and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the lowermost part of the mount. Rabbi Abdimi Bar Chama Bar Chasa said, the Jewish people actually stood beneath the mountain. And the verse teaches that the Holy One, blessed be he, overturned the mountain above the Jews like a tub and said to them, if you accept the Torah, excellent. And if not, there will be your burial. So this Talmudic rabbi says, God is holding this mountain on top of you and, sa and says, right, we receive Torah. That's what we talk about on Shavuot, we re receive Torah. But this text saying, here is the mountain and what's God doing? Threatening. A little bit. Threatening. He's making you fear. Yeah. You better accept this. Take this out of- I'm take, drop this mountain on you. Or I'm gonna drop this mountain on you. Yeah, wow. I am going to take this mountain and drop it on you. So you better follow these commandments. It's not, it doesn't sound much like receiving. It sounds like threatening or, um, or else. Making you an offer you can't refuse. Right, and, and it's an offer that you can't, right? And if you don't, if you refuse it, it's gonna be a bad ending. We follow Torah because we're nervous about God. Mm. What will God do to us? And I think, right, some people do follow Torah like that yeah. because they are scared about what, if I don't follow this commandment, if I don't do this, or if I don't do that, something terrible might happen to me. Some people might not receive Torah, but uh, have accepted Torah because of God's power. And now here's another interpretation from Yehuda Amichai. Can someone read that poem for me? When God left the earth, he forgot the Torah with the Jews. And since then, they look for him and cry after him. You forgot something. Mm -hmm. You forgot in a loud voice. And others think that this is the prayer of the Jews. And since then, they strain to find hints in the Bible as to the place he might be found. As it says, seek the Lord where he is to be found. Call upon him when he is close but he is far. Wow. Wow. So we might have received Torah. We might have taken Torah because we were scared and so we were threatened to receive it. And Amichai says, actually, what are we trying to do here? What's happening here? God forgot the Torah and we're trying to return it to God, <laughs> right? Wow. And Mount Sinai, here's the Torah, you, you received it, but now we have to, God mistakenly left it behind. And our goal is to search for God, for, search for God to give Torah back. And so how do you do that? 
Amichai would say. They, um, they're looking for him in the Bible. Yeah, exactly. I want hints in the Bible of where to find God. I want to search. I'm searching for God. And to, to give it to God uh, so God can take it back. And so this whole idea, Amichai, is a beautiful play on why do we have Torah? And Torah is for us to perhaps search, right? We don't, and, uh, and where, what are the answers? And maybe it's not something we always want, but where can we, um, where can we search for God? When, when, where do we feel lost? Where do we, where are we lost sometimes? And we look at this text and we kind of try to bring it back. Mm -hmm. How does this poem uh, feel for people? The answers all, we have the answers with us all along. What do you mean? So the answers are always with us. So Torah, Torah is the answer. And it's there and we have to look for it? Mm hmm Okay. Well, the, the comment Sorry. about when God left the earth, he forgot the Torah with the Jews. You know, sometimes you forget things when you want somebody to have it after you leave right oh. so there's that intentional forgetting mm. oh right? right that it's it's like i'm leaving this and i'm forgetting it because i want it to stay with you i want you to have a piece of me when i'm gone right it's like oh when someone says like yeah i don't like they don't they won't take your money but you leave the money there right like at, well, like oh more than that or well, no, it's like, I have this, I, like, when I was, like, a little kid, my cousin came and he left his milk bottle, like, his little milk bottle toy. And I wrote a letter back to my aunt and I said, I still have Stuart's milk bottle toy, I'll rebring it. And I still have that letter because we got it back. But, but it's that sense of, you know, like, sometimes you leave things because you want people to have a piece of you, like a physical something when you're, when you went back home or when you've left. So your, your, your interpretation of Amichai's poem a little bit is... God, God, God left that on purpose. God left Torah on purpose for us to look for and search. And so we'd always have a piece. So we'd have a tangible piece of him with, of God with us. Not just kind of, but it's, it's physical. Mm. Or potentially an excuse. Like you might forget something at someone's house so that you, know, you have an excuse to meet them again. You can imagine someone doing it maybe for someone they like meet at a party and like, oh, I want to ask this person out. I want to talk to them again. I want to kindle this relationship. So you forget your hat. So you've got an excuse to say, hey, I think you have my hat. Let's talk again. Mm -hmm. And right. so you can almost yeah. imagine God doing it that way too, to say, let me forget something. So you have an excuse to come to me. Right. Like, let's meet again. Well, but, the, but there's a mysterious last line there. Yeah. yeah. That basically says, well, it says, call upon him when he is close, but he is far. So it is, seems to me that you can interpret that and say, you're not going to find God. He's too far. It's too hard. Okay. You have to do this on your own. Um, uh, that's I, it's possible. I just think that he's far. So it's, it's work. It's, it's not easy. No, it's not handed to you. I don't think. I think we're, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I think what he is saying uh, is that they look in the Bible and as a seek the Lord where he is to be found, the Bible tells us that we're all created in God's image. And I think what he's saying is there is some God in all of us. And if you will choose to accept God, uh, he will, he, she will be close to you. When it says, but he is far, I think he's excoriating people in general, Jews in general, for letting God be away from us when it really is not that difficult to have him close because he's right there. Beautiful interpretations. That's very good. Of uh, mm -hmm. Amakai's poem. I, like that. Yeah. I look at this poem for me and I say, I, Torah is a tool for me to connect to God. Um, and there's our, there, I, I need to search it. I need to figure out what Torah means to me so I can connect to God perhaps different ways. And Howard says that seeking God where God can be found, he could be close. He could be the person in the square next to you or above you. Um, or perhaps 
what are the other hints in the Torah that kind of lead us to a path to find God? Uh, the stories, the values, perhaps it's the mitzvot that we should follow, or perhaps it's the Shabbat that we want to experience, or perhaps it's something else that we don't know that we haven't found quite yet. Um, and maybe it's our goal to kind of continue to search to find God in different moments in our lives. And I think that's what the holiday of Shabbat is all about. How can we uh, feel that um, that moment at Sinai? Hopefully not as fear, but sometimes yes. Uh, but actually a, a hide and seek perhaps to uncover what it means for us um, at this moment too. Any final comments before um, we say goodnight? Am I the only one that, I, I don't know, I found that one disturbing and um, depressing and yeah. you, I mean, I know some people are saying, you know, when you have an ulterior motive for forgetting things, but the more common thing is something was unimportant and that's why you forgot it. So was the Torah unimportant that, that God didn't care about it? So it, God didn't pay attention that it was left behind. I, I don't know. I thought that one was kind of dark. I don't know. No. That's why we. That's why people love poetry, right? We can all we can all interpret it. Anyone else have a final comment or two before we say uh, good night and thank you for joining us? I just want to thank you for doing this. This is the, yeah. you know, we did for uh, right before the High Holy Days. We did a program with the other congregations. Mm -hmm. We've done a few now, and I think whether it's in person or virtually, I think that's really great. I, I really commend. I'm sorry I only got to see one other, um, one other congregations rabbi, but um, uh, 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 um, in the session before and didn't get the other to meet more of their clergy, but I, I, really, I really think it's great that we do this. Yeah, I think it's been, a, I, I think it's, uh, it's always fun partnering with Rabbi Tillman um, and we look forward that we can, uh, and other rabbis who are not on the call right now, um, but I think it's a, a really great partnership that we can continue to have um, and do more things. Slichot, we are hopefully planning to do something again. Hopefully it won't be virtual, um, but if it is, we saw that it works out pretty well, um, and um, uh, we look forward to doing more. We're in very close proximity, um, and so it's always fun to get to teach and get to learn together. A community has a lot of nice young rabbis. <laughs> a lot of young rabbis. It's good. Yeah, definitely. Young we see Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we have uh, uh, Rabbi Tillman. You have services tomorrow morning. Yeah, we do at uh, nine thirty. You can uh, join us on uh, on Facebook Live from uh, Congregation Beth Israel on Facebook. We'll be right. live streaming there at nine thirty. And we have services at ten o'clock. And if you really want to go, I'm sure Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Head Tillman has second day should services. And, uh, well, we, we do also. <laughs> so you can go to uh, uh, Emmanuel tomorrow, and then us, uh, and you can get a, a, your whole uh, Shavuot uh, for an, an extra day as well if you want. Perfect. I can ask um, Rabbi Tillman how the uh, cheesecake came out. Oh yeah, how's your cheesecake? It looks, uh, it looks really good, um, but I don't want to cut into it yet because everyone else has now gone to sleep. But uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> you left us all hanging and hungry. But it looks uh, it looks great. Yeah, I think it's just cool enough now that you know I could slice into it, but maybe you know, I should wait till, uh, till tomorrow. Yeah, have a good Yeah. Good night, everyone. Have a good wonderful Hag Sameach, uh, and we'll see you soon. Hag Sameach. Good night, Hag Sameach. Have a toad. It was fabulous. It was wonderful. Wonderful.